And good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Tech Talk by DigitalOcean. I'm your host today, Mason Egger. You've probably seen me do a couple of these before. And today we're going to be talking about the Microsoft Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows 10. So I, I've i gotten a lot of questions. Uh, every, time I, every time I've done a Tech Talk so far, I always get questions. You're using Windows. How are you using Windows? And I finally got my tutorial written to where I can now not only show you how I'm using Windows, like you can follow along with the tutorial, but I'm also today going to show you exactly how I develop. So this is really going to kind of be a little bit more, I would say a little bit more of a casual tech talk. Um, please ask questions and stuff like that, because I'm going to just show you how I develop on Windows. You know, I started, whenever I started at DigitalOcean, oh, almost two years ago, um, they gave me, it gave us all an option between, you know, a Mac or a Windows PC. Um, and I made myself get the Windows PC. And I was like, I'm going to learn how to do, I'm going to learn how to develop on Windows. I'm going to make myself do it. And I've been doing it ever since, and it's turned out pretty good. Uh, but good morning to our chat today. Caleb says hello. Hello, Caleb. Hello, Carlos. Hello, Henry. Uh, hello, Tala. I hope that's how I pronounce your name. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to talk about the Windows subsystem for Linux. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this tutorial in the chat. And then once it's done, uh, once we'll, we'll drop it again towards the end. We'll drop it periodically in the chat. Um, uh, and we'll be, yeah, that way you can use this if you need to, to set up your own environment. And there's actually going to be a second tutorial coming out that's going to cover the latter half. So uh, Duart says hello. Daryl says hello. Blake says hello. Good morning to you. Uh, it's great to see everyone here this morning. So let's go ahead and talk about it. So if you're unaware of the Windows subsystem for Linux, the Windows subsystem for Linux is, you know, essentially it's a really cool program that allows for native uh, Linux machines to run on Windows. So it was a really interesting uh, thing when it came out and it's it just gotten better. You know, Microsoft used to not have the greatest relationship with Linux, um, never really supported it, didn't want to support any of it. And then, you know, with new leadership that came whenever uh, Satya Nadella took over as CEO, Microsoft really started to, you know, get into the open source community, get into the Linux community, and it's just it's just gotten better and better ever since. So the Windows subsystem for Linux, the original one, basically ran a background VM uh, and shipped a Linux kernel that essentially allowed you to run a Linux operating system on your machine as if you were like it, as if you just were running Linux. Like it was like having Bash on Windows. Um, the Windows subsystem for Linux 2 is the latest iteration of this, and this takes great advantage of Hyper-V. So if you're unaware of Hyper-V, most Windows systems, especially now in Windows 10, come with Hyper-V uh, installed. Like, it's not enabled, you have to turn it on, but you can run virtual machines on your Windows uh, PC without needing to download something like VirtualBox or VMware, because you can just run them in Hyper-V. So what we're going to do is we're going to install Linux and the WSL, we're, and I'm going to install the new Windows command line tool, which they have also come out with. I'm going to install Docker Desktop and integrate the two, and then we're going to build a really teeny tiny Docker application and kind of just go through all of that. So let's get started. Um, for today's Tech Talk, I am going to be using a virtual machine. Unfortunately, I can't use my personal machine to show you how to install things because of their already all installed. Um, so I have to use this virtual machine. And I'm basically going to follow my own tutorial. Um, currently, it's kind of a manual process. Like you have to do a handful of steps, reboot a couple times. Um, in the future, we don't know when, uh, there will just be this command WSL double space double dash install that you will run in PowerShell and it will run everything for you. Um, this is currently in the Windows Insider program. If you are a part of the Windows Insider program, um, you know that it's uh, essentially like getting the latest versions of Windows. So uh, by doing that, you get access to the, the, the beta features. Um, I don't know when this is going to drop in regular Windows. Eventually it will. 
Um, and then a lot of the steps that I go over today, you could probably still do manually, but they won't be required anymore because they're going to make it easier. But they haven't done that yet. So we have to do it this way. So one thing I would say is if you are running this in a virtual machine, then you're going to need to be wary of this warning box that's in the tutorial. And basically, if you're running it in a virtual machine, you need to be able to use, um, you need to be able to expose virtualization extensions uh, to, so that way your virtual machine can actually see it. Uh, this basically al al allows for virtualization CPU flags to be passed on to the virtual machine, so that way you can virtualize inside of virtualization. I don't recommend um, doing this in like a production setting, like or, or like I would not install Windows and develop solely in Windows in WSL and Windows because now you're running Hyper-V inside of Hyper-V, and that's kind of complicated and that can become messy. Um, but again, for today's sake, I'm going to show you how to do it. And if you need to, here's the way. Um, so we have a quick question, virtual WSL in, and virtual box together. Um, so I haven't done it in a while, but I remember that if I had Hyper-V on, virtual box got very upset and vice versa. So I think you kind of have to pick one um, of which one you want to use. And another good morning to all the other people that are popping up. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and good morning and good morning to everyone who is showing up and it's great to see everyone. So I'm happy to have you all here. So I would say that don't, so like using virtual, the Hyper-V inside of Hyper-V, definitely someone says Inception. Yeah, it gets nasty. Hypervisors don't like to run inside of other hypervisors, so I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but it can be done. It's going to stress your machine. Um, you're going to be virtualizing things that are already virtualized. Uh, you're better off just installing it locally. But if you need to, hey, go ahead. It's it's not it's not the end of the world if you have to. Um, it's just it's gonna act funky sometimes, and you're you're not gonna have the best experience. And I would prefer you have the best experience. I have all of this installed directly on my machine, um, and that's how I do it. So the first thing we have to do is we need to enable. Uh, services. So, and I forgot that because I'm using a virtual machine, I can't type in here. So I have to find, uh, I think it's in the control panel. And for, for some reason, I can't do a type search here. And I want the turn windows features on and off button, which I don't see. There we go. Program features, turn Windows features on and off. So there's two ways I could do this. I'm going to show you how to do this via the UI, but I'm also going to show you how to do this um, with uh, brain with PowerShell in the command line. Uh, while we're waiting on Windows features to turn off and on, we're asked, WSL1 is end of life now, or can we still expect WSL1 uh, to be updated? I don't know if it's end of life yet. Um, I think they want people to move to WSL2. You're right. WSL1 does not support Docker. So if you the re, one of the big things that WSL2 brings out is that you can actually use Docker on it. Um, but WSL1 does not support it. I don't know if it's end of life. Um, I bet it'll be updated for a little while, but I know that eventually it will be, and you're going to want to move to two. So what I would need to do here is there's two services that I need to turn on, one of which is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and the other is the virtual machine platform. So if we look for virtual machine platform, we would check this box and we would check, it says Windows subsystem for Linux. I cannot find it on this one, how odd. Ah, right there, Windows subsystem for Linux. We would check both of these. Um, so what you would do is you would check both of these, click OK, turn them on and all of that. Um, but we're like, and you would click OK, you would restart your computer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just cancel this because I don't, I want to show you how to do it from PowerShell as well. So uh, if you read my tutorial, which again, we'll post later, uh, again, later, because we, come on. There we go. I knew this was gonna be a fun day because I've, I'm using a virtual machine. <laughs> so, 
So, yes. So now we're running a PowerShell as administrator. As you can see, it's a little bit slow. Um, again, virtual machines. My PC is a little old. Uh, it doesn't have the power it used to. So what we're going to use is we're going to use the DISM tool. And I'm sorry if it's a little small. Um, oh, wow, that type's slow. <laughs> okay, it's going to be a fun day. So the DSI, DISM tool is the Windows Deployment Image Servicing and Management tool. It's the same exact tool that we just opened with in the GUI, but it allows us to do this via the command line. So we're going to do DISM.exe slash online slash enable feature slash feature name colon Microsoft dash Windows dash subsystem dash Linux. I think. Let me make sure. Space. Oh, nope. Stop. Is it still going? Wow, that's slow. Okay, this is this is worrisome. <laughs> I did not think it was going to go this slow in typing. We've only got like two commands to run like this, so maybe three. So we're going to just kind of hold on. So I'll answer some questions while we wait on my thing to show up. Um think you need WSL. So WSL2 is a superset, so basically, it, so you don't need the old WSL anymore. Um, I don't know about X server on Windows uh, for WSL. I'm pretty sure it's possible. They wouldn't have done it otherwise. I don't use it. Um, I mostly just want this for the command line tools, so I didn't do uh, any of that. Yeah, now let's go back over here. Space slash all space no restart. Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're enabling the feature and we're telling the computer uh, to do that. And we hit enter. I will try to make the fonts bigger, but again, running in a virtual machine doesn't really give me the option to do that. So I can try, I can't make any guarantees. a little bit better. So yeah, so that enabled the Microsoft Windows subsystem for Linux tool. So the next thing we're going to do is we have to turn on the virtual machine platform. So the, if you just turn on this one, you get Windows subsystem for Linux, but you're not going to get Windows subsystem for Linux too. You need the virtual machine platform, which basically is how it tells it to run the Windows subsystem for Linux. So dism.exe again. I think I typed the wrong letter. I did. XE space online space enable feature space feature name colon virtual machine platform space slash all space no restart. And now we wait. <laughs> this will allow us to enable the virtual machine uh, platform. And then once we do this, we will basically restart Win Linux or sorry, Windows, and it will enable the features. So Windows still needs you to restart the program to get the features to work. Hmm. Blake is saying you actually need X11 on WSL2. The program runs on WSL, but displays on Windows. You need X11 on both system to communicate. That would make sense. That would make sense. Never dealt with it before. Need never had any need to. Like, I, if I run, if I run Kali, I actually just spin it up in a vir, in a virtual machine. I've never actually tried to run Kali for um, on the WSL. I really just only run Ubuntu, so I have a, a terminal. Because once I have a terminal, like with proper SSH and proper Bash, um, then I can just go wherever I need to go and SSH into anything that I need. So I don't worry about it that much. Hit enter. No, I did it again. Come here, you. Hit enter. Come on. No, that's not even going to work because it says no restat. Let 
there. No restart will make it work. And now it's turning on the feature. And we're good. Operation has successfully completed. Clear the screen. And then let's just do a quick sh uh, restart. So shut down slash R slash F slash T zero. Pretty sure. I have to remember my Windows commands. I used to do a lot of Windows administration. So I kind of remember uh, these commands but it's been a minute. Oh, I need a space there. Uh, Asher, for your question about installing uh, the GUI, look up in the comments, you need X11. Uh, Blake was going over it in the comments previously. So I don't have a fix. I can't show a fix in this tutorial today. Um, but you will need to just Google X11 WSL and you'll probably be able to get to it. I don't have anything on that. So you restart Windows and it basically says, hey, we're working on the updates. It's going to update your computer real quick and we're going to get our WSL working. takes a second. So while we're doing that, let's talk about some other stuff while we're waiting on Windows. This is going to be a more, a little bit of a slower tech talk today. So once we're done with that, we need to download this WSL update page. And it's basically a kernel, a Linux kernel patch um, that allows you to actually, you know, get the Linux kernel installed and use it properly. So again, once we get to, you know, where this is installed, it will do all this for us. But at the moment, we actually have to download this up MSI. Um, and then you would basically just go through. It's a really simple install. Um, you just download, run it, and it just works. So now we have to wait on this to install or to op open up. There we go. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and download that patch. I don't want to restore Microsoft Edge. No, just open. I don't want anything else. You're complete, go away. Continue without signing in. So we're gonna go to do.co slash tutorials to get to my tutorial. We're gonna go to my tutorials right here, Windows Subsystem for Linux. And then we have a link directly to the WSI update package. It's gonna ask us what we wanna do with it. It's gonna download it really quick. It's only 14.6 megs. Should come through hopefully relatively quickly. Interesting to see how it's coming down at 200 kilobytes per second. Seeing as how, it's probably has to do with like the virtual machine adapters. I have gigabit internet here, so it should come down a lot quicker than that. So we're going to download this, and then we basically just execute it. It's a really straightforward executable. And we're going to open it in 30 seconds, and then we'll do that. And then after that, we set the WSL version set default version to 2, and then we actually will be having WSL 2 will be installed and we'll be ready to go. And this is an initial setup you only have to do once. So this is kind of like installing all of your packages at the very beginning, getting your favorite text editor installed and all that stuff. You only need it a little bit at the beginning. You're not gonna need it the entire, like you're not gonna have to do this every single time. Like this is a one and done. Um, I, I've installed, I installed WSL2 on my PC. I don't even know how long ago it's been since I've installed it. Um, yeah, but as you see, we click next, we say yes, we say next, we say finish, we're done. Like that was how easy it was to install that patch. So let's minimize that and let's bring up PowerShell again because we need to do one more command. Run as administrator. Yes, I wanna run PowerShell as an admin. And then the last thing I have to do 
move this back over here so I can see it, is we're just going to run WSL double dash set default version two. I'm glad that that actually worked. Looks a little bit better now. Actually, let me up. Maybe it was the maybe it was the font. Maybe once I up up the font, it was being weird. No, it's still 24. Okay, y'all can still be able to see that. Okay, and now WSL two is the different is is set up and we're good to go. So now WSL2 is installed, but we've not done anything yet with it. We haven't installed an operating system yet or anything. So let's install Ubuntu. So now we would basically just go to the Microsoft Store. And we're going to install, we're just going to search for Linux. <clears throat> And there's a whole bunch. Kali Linux is there. Ubuntu is here. Ubuntu 2004 LTS is here. Um, I think this Ubuntu just points to the latest LTS. So we're just going to in install the Ubuntu one. It only works with like canonical based and SUSE based. I have not seen a supported Fedora or CentOS install yet. So we're just going to click install here. I'm going to say no, I don't want to sign in. And now I fight with it a little bit. There it goes. Finally. So it starts the download. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Okay, now we're getting like two megabytes per second. So now we're getting like good speeds, 28. So megabits, sorry. Um, so now it's gonna download Ubuntu. It's gonna download a working version of Ubuntu. And it's just, it's a basically, it's an image that is ready to run. It looks like it's only 453.7 megabytes. So it's a relatively small image. Um, a little bit bigger than a Docker container, but still pretty decent size. And we're installing Ubuntu, and we're good. And now we just click the launch button. And the first time that you do this, it's going to ask you to set up a user. So the, it's going to—it's not going to use like your default user from uh, Windows. You're actually going to have to set up a specific Unix user for this. And we're also about to see if I did this right, because like I like I've every now and then I run into an Oh, nope. Okay, looks like it worked. Uh, if I don't set up the, the Hyper-V stuff right, which my tutorial says I did it right, um, it gets cranky at me. It gets really cranky at me. So we're going to do mEgger as my username. We're going to set a password. Okay, and now we have Ubuntu running on Windows. Like This is natively running on Windows. Um, like it, It's on the same local host network. Like It's doing everything. Now, uh, the one thing I don't like about this is I don't like this Ubuntu tab. Like I don't like this shell. It's not the greatest. Like it's a it's okay, but it's not great. Like I don't I, I don't open this. Um, so the other thing that Windows has done that's really cool that I like is they've redone command line. Uh, ah, it's called terminal now. It's not called. So basically. Um, they have open sourced the Windows terminal, like the old command line tool, and now it supports all of your WSLs. It supports Azure Cloud Shell, PowerShell, CMD. So we're going to go ahead and install this. I don't want to sign in. And this is just what I use. So now this is a new uh, Windows terminal. I really like it. It's been really good um, so far. I've had almost no problems with it uh, other than it makes a lot of dinging noises with the bell. So you have to be able to turn off the bell, which I finally found the feature for that. Um, you don't want any audible. Like I don't, I don't like audible bells. Like I know I'm hitting tab, leave me alone. Okay. So we have it and it by default opens up PowerShell. So um, if we come over here and we hit this plus tab, we're going to get another PowerShell window. So we can always open up what our new default is here. The next thing we do is, as you can see, we can open up all of our different ones. We can open up command prompt if you want old school command line. We can open up an Azure Cloud Shell, but now our Ubuntu is here. And if you had any other Linuxes installed here, so if we installed SUSE or Kali or anything like that, we could open up a command line prompt in it. So I click Ubuntu, and I'm sitting here in my basically my default folder, uh, which is mount slash mount C users. So with Linux mounts your directory or the WSL mounts your current home, like your home directory into this uh, terminal, which we can easily change. 
So let's go ahead and do that. So one, I don't want PowerShell being my default anymore. So let's go to settings. And it's relatively straightforward. You just say for your default profile, I want Ubuntu. Um, you can choose whether or not you want to launch it on startup, new instance behavior, rows and columns, um, interaction. You can change like the type of formatting, the appearance, uh, color scheme, rendering, actions. These are all your commands that you can do on it. And then for profile, the Ubuntu profiles, you can say what you want your default directory to be. So if we browse, we can actually browse our local drive and see whatever we want to do here. But the other thing we can do here is instead of doing user profile, which this is Linux level stuff. Yeah. We're just going to say uh, slash home slash M Egger. We're going to click save. And then if I open up a new one, it did not do what I thought it was going to do. How did I do this? Did I not put this in my tutorial on how to do this? I did not. Well then, let's do what anyone else would do. Let's check and see what my actual settings are on the one that I actually use in production. Okay, so you have to use some specific uh, things. So double slash WSL. So with inside the WSL, inside of the Ubuntu one, home Imager. So uh, I should probably add that to my tutorial. So if we come back over here and we just paste, I can't do that because I can't paste between these things. Um, where'd it go? So it's double slash WSL dollar. Uh, I think it's just called Ubuntu here. We don't have it as 2004 because I don't have multiple versions. And we click uh, W or I need a slash WSL dollar slash. Let's try that. And we got it. We're here at my home directory. And my, what would be my Linux home directory? So this directory though, you can't see from the Windows side. Like I can't access that. But if I went to slash mount slash C slash users, uh, one, five, one, two, three. Um, this is like, here's my, my, my favorites. Let's do an LS, not a, yeah, LS dash L. Yeah. So my OneDrive, pictures, favorites, documents, I can downloads, I can access everything that I've done inside of here. So it mounts my my Windows directory into this, but it also gives me just the straightforward, you know, home directory. Um, I do believe performance is better when you have stuff in the native Linux file system. So if you're putting stuff in um, as you can see, so like, let's just look at it. See, all of this up here is DWRWX. Like, even if it's just a regular directory, like they're all 777, like this .ini file is 777 and stuff. Um, it is mounting it in as NTFS, which Linux, eh, not so, not so nice with. So if you want better performance, if you want like, like I've, I've done it where if I have too big of a directory and I'm parsing it, it will actually like be slow trying to list the contents of the directory. So your best bet is to do it inside the native file system and then only use the mount system to move stuff in and out of it. So, yeah. And then the other thing is in the advanced settings, this is where you come over here and you turn that bell off because nobody wants to hear that. Um, but yeah, now you have the Windows command line tool installed and like, you know, I can run Python, you know, I can run Python 3 because I hit Python 3.8.5. Like this is you name dash A, uh, dash R, right? Yeah. Microsoft standard WSL two, uh, but it's Linux. You can see that this is Linux and it's a special version of it for it, but this is a working version of Ubuntu. So now let's do a few more things. Let's go ahead and do Docker desktop. Let's get Docker running in here so we can actually develop in this. So Docker desktop for Windows. Yeah, get Docker. Go ahead and download this. And once
once it's complete, it will open and we'll install Docker. Are there any questions in the chat while we're waiting on these downloads and stuff? Are you suggesting to use the native home Linux directory instead of the Windows when creating Python files? What about if I delete the Ubuntu, will I lose all my files? Um, yes, do not, yes. So I'm saying that if you're worried about file system performance, um, then it was it is best to do it inside of the native Linux directory, not the Windows directory. Um, if you delete the Ubuntu, the WSL thing, you will delete all of the files in there. Now, one, you'd have to really try to delete it. You're not going to accidentally delete it unless you're uninstalling Ubuntu. Um, if you want to keep things backed up in the Windows directory, you can. You can always rsync over to that directory. You can store stuff in GitHub so you don't lose your code. Um, but yeah, I would I would recommend it because like I've I've worked in big enough Git repositories that like had enough that had you know hunt like thousands of commits and doing an ls or any command inside that repository is slow like a git status takes three to four seconds to run in that directory um because it's parsing all of those files so doing it in the native uh, thing will get you better performance if your directories are ginormous if they're small you could probably get away with it it doesn't matter um but yeah that's what i would recommend so now that we have Docker desktop ready, it's just going to ask us if we wanted to install it. We said yes. It says install required Windows components for WSL2, and I don't need a shortcut to the desktop. Um, so we're going to click OK, and this is going to install. It takes a little bit of time. So and Anto says the new update ruined my day. The new update for Docker, are you saying? Um, I think I'm on like 3.3. I don't know what version of Docker I'm on. settings what version how do i know what version i'm on well it says upgrade so i must be behind well, let's go to home oh i don't even know what those are uh I don't know. So Docker makes you... What on earth? Why are there 53 images on here? Oh, yeah, I do a lot of junk. Well, let's clean that up while we're here. This is how you clean up on Docker Desktop if you want. Well, then force the, con the removal. I'll do that. Uh, I think if you can just keep doing it, it'll keep deleting a couple of them. Am I getting any space back? No. Mm, I'll delete those later. Uh, it's easier just to do that from the command line. LSB release dash A in the command line. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. There you go. It's Ubuntu 20.04. So WSL2 does have some networking uh, issues. I have I do know people that run into it. Um, I know people that work at DigitalOcean at a cloud provider and do their entire job on WSL2. So there are like VPNs can be a little bit uh, irritating sometimes. Um, I've heard. Uh, I've never had any networking problems with it. But I will also admit that I've never done any complex networking programming. Um, uh, in 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 WSL two, so like like super complex, super heavy stuff. Uh, but uh, Giovanni asks, do I think the Windows files will get corrupted if I manipulate them from the terminal, or vice versa, or if I manipulate the Linux files from the? No, uh, they won't. I actually, up until very recently, I ran all of my stuff in the mounted uh, directory. So they won't get corrupted. They work just fine. I've used it to copy and paste stuff um, just fine, and it works. Uh, like, I haven't had any problems with it. So what... No, okay, so people are asking, what networking issues are you are you experiencing? Like, I, 
I, I mean, I can connect anything out. Um, I can access everything on the local host. Like, I mean, I've heard that VPN can kind of be, I think I know what you're talking about. I used to have DNS issues. I used to have really wonky DNS issues with like the DNS cache not working. Um, I don't have those issues anymore. Ever since I upgraded WSL2, I, I remember that. Like whenever I first started here, I used to have like DNS was resolution issues all the time in WSL2. And then one day they just kind of went away. So I don't know. I, that's a weird one. I, I do remember having a lot of issues with that. So Docker engine is starting. We're waiting on it to come up and then we're going to um, modify some settings here once it's up and running to make it where we can use Docker inside of the WSL2. Let me Windows terminal, get a terminal running. While we're waiting on Docker to set up, we're gonna do one other thing. You need to map WSL's IP address to Windows to host, to host something publicly. Like if you wanted to, are you saying like if you wanted to host something on your, on your desktop's IP address, not on localhost? I can host things on localhost just fine, and I've never had the need to map anything on my laptop externally to other people to see. If I like, like if I need to do that, I would have. I like. I just typically, if, if I need something to be public, I typically use a droplet. To be honest, um, let's go ahead and install VS Code while we're waiting. I don't need the tutorial. Go away. So we'll come back. Let's download VS Code. While we're let, waiting on VS Code to download. And we're going to click. Oh, nope. It's already open. Uh, Cool. We'll go ahead and install VS Code, and then we'll configure Docker. Uh, I, you know, I would probably click some of those check boxes if I was doing this permanently. So anyway, so to configure Docker with WSL, you would come over here to settings and uh, do, 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 do. I don't need the tip of the week. Please go away. So we go under resources and you go to WSL integration and it says enable integration with it with my default WSL distro. Now, all of your WSL distros will show here and whenever you want to actually act, um, you want to actively do that, then you would just click Ubuntu and click Apply and Restart. Corporate security routinely blocks WSL networking. Yeah, you know, I can see that. I can see corporate networking do that. To be fair, corporate networking used to block some of my stuff on my MacBook too. Um, I'm glad I work from home now. I don't have to deal with the corporate network being, being cranky about it to me anymore. Um, but now we have that. So let's go over here and let's do docker run hello dash world. Permission denied. I did click apply and restart. Do I have to close and reopen this to make it work? I'm on. There we go. Okay, so I had to I had to restart it once I enabled it. So it's unable to find Hello World locally, and it should just pull it down and run it. And now we have uh, we have it here, and it works with Mmaker. I don't need to use sudo for this. I have the whenever I enable it here, it automatically adds my default user uh, to to it. So I don't need to use sudo to use Docker here. But yeah, so now we have Docker running in WSL2. So we almost have a full developer environment. I use Visual Studio Code. It's just the, the thing that I use. Um, is it going to, is it launching for us? Yes, it's launching for us right now. So having Visual Studio Code installed, it comes up and it says, hey, you have Windows for subsystem for Linux installed on your system. Do you want to install the recommended extension? So yeah, let's do that. And now, whenever I want to, uh, I wish I could zoom in on this, but I don't know how right now. 
Um, whenever I want to develop now, I just develop inside the WSL. So let's go ahead and create a file real quick. Let's go ahead and come here. Let me go to my, I'm going to look for some code on my GitHub that I, website redirect. Here we go. So let's go to my directory here. Let's do MKDIR. We're going to call it website redirect. And inside this website redirect, we're going to have an app, a uh, vim app, or we're just going to touch app.py. So we're going to have a Python file. So what I would probably do here now is I'd probably install the Python extension real quick. Uh, we build some Docker container to inject proxy and DNS. I've heard of this. I've heard of people doing this, um, where they inject proxy and DNS inside WSL2 to do it. Um, yeah, I've heard of that before. I don't have to do it, luckily enough. But I've, I, that's that's not unheard of to have to do that. Uh, I've heard it. I've heard of it. Never had to do it. Wish the Python one would move a little bit quicker. Actually, I'm doing this wrong. I, I should have installed this inside of here. So while we're waiting on that, we're going to go to File, Open Folder. And we actually can't see our folders because they're in the home directory. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and we're going to click on this little green button in the bottom left. Um, we're going to click Open Folder in WSL. And basically what it's going to let us do is it's going to let us find... our folder that we want to open. We're going to click select folder. And it's going to have our folders. It's going to open up VS code in WSL. It's opening the remote connection to it. It's doing its first installation. So it's like unpacking all of the stuff. You uh, So someone asks, do we know if uh, JetBrains supports WSL? I've used PyCharm and it doesn't support it as fully as this does where I like, but I can create and um, I can run, I can set my default Python interpreter in JetBrains to a WSL Python interpreter. Um, so you can use Jet PyCharm at least with, Jet, with WSL too. Um, there are tutorials on it, so I would definitely look into them. Yeah, I love having a, someone says, now we have some happier developers that have a full Linux command line. I love having it. Now I don't have to switch, like I used to dual boot. I don't have to dual boot anymore to, uh, you know, like, oh, I want to play games or, oh, I want to use this software that's only used on Windows. Let me reboot my machine real quick and go into here. And it's like, oh, nasty, no fun. So what I'm going to do real quick, I'm not going to really go over much. I can't copy paste. Import OS. How do I make this bigger? Settings, font. Let's make this 24. There we go. So we're just going to write a really quick uh, little app from Flask import Flask redirect uh, app equals Flask double underscore name app dot route and basically all we're gonna do is we're gonna write a little redirect app real quick that is literally just gonna read do a re return redirect os dot environ can never spell that right for some reason dot get redirect to https colon double backslash mason dot dev so we don't get anything there. We're going to do that. And we're just going to give it a code equals 301. Then we're going to say if dunder name equal equal dunder main. Log Actually, we're not even going to do the logging stuff this time. I'm going to be a bad equals 
0 0.0.0.0. 0 .0 .0 .0. Come on. Port equals 8080. There. We got that. I'm not even going to install the Python extension. Um, so we have a little Python app here. And we're going to create a Docker image real quick. To run this Python thing. So Docker file. We're going to say from Python. We're going to set our work directory equal to var dub dub dub. We're going to set our env redirect to we're going to set this to just mason.dev which is already set to by default but we can do it here we're going to copy dot whack app.py so slash var dub 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 app.py we're going to copy a dot whack requirements dot txt to var dub 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 requirements dot txt which I haven't done yet. I have to create that. Copy dot whack g unicorn config dot py to var dub 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 g unicorn config dot py. Then we're going to do run pip install dash r var dub 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 requirements dot txt. And then for our command g unicorn double dash config equals g unicorn config.py app colon app. Okay, so that should be a working Docker file for us. The requirements.txt I'm going to be a little bit lazy with, and we're just going to do requirements.txt. We're just going to put Flask in here, so that way it installs Flask. And then for the gunicorn config.py, we're just going to bind it, which I probably don't even need to do this because I set the app thing up, but... It's no biggie. 8080, and we're going to give it two workers. So I'm there. So now we have a working, we should have a working Docker file. Hopefully I typed everything perfectly. We're going to find out if I didn't. So now we've, I'm doing all this inside of WSL2, and now I can come over here and just set up a new terminal. Terminal is going to be a little bit small, but now I can just do Docker build, well, actually clear LS. So I'm within my current Docker directory build right now. So let's go ahead and just do docker build dash t reader dot. We're going to find out if it works. So we're just going to build this docker file real quick. We're going to copy the files over that we need. And we're going to have a docker directory that just does a redirect. If I go to this, it's just going to do a local, like, just redirect to a different thing. You could do this with, like, Apache or Nginx, and you could just you do it, like, you know, with, the, with one of those. But for the sake of, you know, building a small little Python app, let's do it. As you can see, VS Code also has things for Docker. We're not going to deal with that right now. Waiting on it to... Which, which layer is it building? Mm, that layer right there is only halfway done. 30-something seconds. Any questions while we're waiting on the Docker build? I guess while we're here, I'll go ahead and drop the uh, tutorial again at the chat. So if you want to be able to set this up on your own, you can. Oh my goodness. Come on, internet. You can do it. I don't think it's the internet at this point. I think it's the... Oh no, it is getting the live the images from the Python library. Come on. This layer is taking forever. <sighs> While we're waiting on that, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about DigitalOcean Deploy because we have to don't want any dead space. So if you haven't heard yet, DigitalOcean is having our second deploy conference in 19 days, 21 hours, and 10 minutes on June 29th, 2021. So you should come by and you'll see all of your favorite people maybe talking. Myself, Chris, our new developer. I don't know. She'll be doing a cloud chats with us. So if you watch cloud chats with us, you'll get to see a lot of it. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a conference based around like building your small business in the cloud. So there's going to be a lot of really good talks. I'm talking about scalability. Um, there may be some fun giveaways, some fun announcements. You know, it's going to be a fun old time. So I highly recommend coming to DigitalOcean's Deploy Conference. Uh, let's look at the agenda while we're waiting. 
So we have our keynote and we have some startup sessions. So growth strategies, uh, building AI powered tools, social media marketing for organic engagement and brand, brand trust. I know a lot of engineers don't really put a lot of uh, thought into marketing. I used to be one of them. It's like, who needs marketing? And now that I work as a developer advocate in marketing, uh, you need marketing. You do. You may think you don't. You're wrong. You need marketing. Uh, so yeah, lots of really fun things that are going to be here. Uh, Cloud Chats is going to be fun. I'm talking about scaling an app platform, building production-ready apps, uh, customer acquisitions from my good friend Arf. So many good people here. So much good to talk about. I hope that you can make it. I think it would be very beneficial to you. Okay, so you're going to pretend that the Docker container didn't take forever to build and that it magically worked. Um, but it does. As you can see, like we're building Docker. We have direct access from VS Code into a Linux environment. I'm doing this all from Windows. Like it's it's like nothing. It's like nothing ever happened. I just open it up, and then I have Windows. Now I want to go play some games or use some software that only Windows supports. I do that. Um, you know, I guess if you owned a Mac, it wouldn't be that big of a problem. But I don't know. This this PC here costs a tenth of what it costs to buy, to build a Mac of the same same specs. So that's all I got to say about that. I'm going to hang around for a little bit while we wait on this to go because it looks like where are we at? Looks like all the layers are good at just extracting that last shaw. Okay, so someone asked, is it mandatory to set WSL config file to manage our memory and processor when using WSL2? Well, the answer I can give to you to that is I don't even know what that is. So you obviously don't need to set it. Um, I guess it manages your memory and processor. I let WSL2 take as much of the power as I was as it wants as, because I'm not concerned about it going overboard. I want it to use the full resources. If I'm if I'm using it, I'm developing on it. And if I'm developing on it, I want it to have the resources of my PC. Um, so I've never used that before. So I guess you can use it to limit it to make sure that you don't eat all of your uh, processing power. But I think you're good. I think I don't think you need it. Oh, I didn't do the pip. <sighs> I hope I didn't do the right. I forgot a thing inside of the requirements. So we need to put G unicorn here. It means I'm going to have to uh, rebuild this Docker container. <laughs> That's irritating. Pretend the Docker container built. This is what happens when you do things quickly. I'm hoping that if I can just run it again, it'll keep that first layer because that first layer is really what slowed us down. Okay, so that's good. Let's do another build. Please don't do the whole thing again. Okay, it didn't, thank goodness. <laughs> it detected the G, I guess it detected the G unicorn config had changed, so it recopied it, which is nice. So now it's installing G Unicorn. So now the Docker container should actually run. <sighs> so now if we do Docker run dash P8080 colon, actually, I don't know how you're gonna do it from there because that's really small to see. So now we have Docker running here. So we can do Docker run dash P8080 colon 8080 reader. You can ask me if I want to allow access. We're going to say yes. I want it to have access to the networks. So now it's just running on localhost port 8080. So if I go to that, never ready, Microsoft. There it is. Localhost colon 8080. It did a redirect because the Docker container is running. It's running on our local host loopback loop back device. It saw the request. Um, if I come back over here, maybe it'll show up in the... I don't have anything logging, so it's not going to show up. But yeah, it did it. And that's all I have for the Tech Talk today. 
Uh, if you would like to contact me, you can. I'll post in the chat, but you can either tweet at me at Mason Egger or you can email me at Mason at DigitalOcean.com. So that's my Twitter handle, and then my Mason at DigitalOcean.com is how you can email me if you would like to chat with me. Um, that's all I have to show you for today, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And yes, if anyone has any questions um, or anything like that, please feel free to ask them. I can stay for, I'm actually a little bit early today, so we don't have to run away. I will, however, do this though. I'll leave this up so that way you know that you need to go and register for deploy. Everyone should register for deploy. Well, I'm glad you love DigitalOcean, Tyler. We love we love you too. We do really care about our customers. It's why we do these all the time. It's a lot of fun. I love interacting with y'all. I hope y'all had a good time today. Um, there's the tutorial covers half of this. I'm working on the second half. So the first half of the tutorial, the tutorial that I posted covers getting WSL installed and getting Windows installed. The second tutorial um, will. Uh, the second tutorial will cover the VS Code, the Docker integration, and then building this exact same app. So I'm working on those two right now, on that right now, and then you'll have everything. Um, deploy conference, please come by. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're not going to want to miss this. Um, I can't say anything more than that, but it's a great conference. You're not going to want to miss it. You get to hang out with me again. And isn't that just lovely? So thank you, everyone, today for showing up. I'll stick around for another minute if you have any questions. And if not, then we will see you next time. What is my next Tech Talk? My next Tech Talk, I'm building a Discord bot in Python. So if you if you do use Discord and you want to build bots, we're going to get into some bot stuff. Uh, can we use devices connected in Windows E, the USB to serial and WSL? Um, so you have full access to everything that's mounted in Windows. Now, if you're using like secondary, like, you know, I don't know. I've never tried it. Like, I don't do that complicated of stuff with it, to be honest. I really just write code in it. You have access to everything that's USB-based. So if it is USB, like, like the way you would in Linux, it's under, I think they're under slash dev. Um, so you'll have access to them. Uh, whether or not it works, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, Hyper-V is pretty good about passing in hardware. It's not the best, but it's not bad at it. Um, so I think it's actually not a bad idea. I think try it. Try it and let me know. Tweet at me and let me know. I would love to know the answer to this. I've never actually needed to. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and see you next time. I'll be doing Discord bots. That'll be fun. And then it'll be Q Q3, and then I've got a whole new slew of tech talks for you. So have a great day, everyone, and I